Hey, this is Sarah. I'm at the Museum of Communications in Seattle, and I thought I'd do a video just talking about what this desk is and how it was used, and maybe I can demonstrate a few things that I could do. Um, so I'm going to try to speak up because I know the motors are loud and the camera likes to pick that up. I've actually shut off all of the motors I'm not using right now, so hopefully that will bring the noise level down to something more more palatable. So anyway, uh, this is called the OGT desk. It was originally uh, installed with the panel switch in 1923, so this looks like a switchboard, but it's actually a part of the panel switch itself. It's an integral part of the machine. The primary purpose of this desk is actually as test equipment. So you can think of all this apparatus here as just for testing. The desk itself is divided up into two positions. The side that I'm sitting on is the trunk test position, and this side with all my tools and junk on it is the sender monitor position there. Here at the trunk test position, I'll point out a few of the things we have. Uh, this whole backboard here with the yellow uh, plugs in it are actually trunks. Now those are trunks is in telephony is what actually links this office to the, all the other central offices in the area. So if you were to read the labels on these positions here, you'd see uh, trunks to Rockwell 2, the mutual office, the main office, uh, and so on. So what I could do here is take a cord and then plug it into one of those trunks and then I would have a connection to that distant office that I could test over and there are positions for every trunk that would have been directly connected to Parkway. That's the name of this panel office. Um, besides the trunk positions, we have a, a large voltmeter. It's also a milliammeter, and that's for taking readings on the trunk itself. Um, these buttons here, or these keys here, are kind of miscellaneous. Uh, most of these are tie lines to various other positions in the office so you can talk over them. Uh, some of these keys actually give me lines in the panel office, so if I flick that one, I have a line and I can dial out on it or receive calls inbound. Um, I have three cords that I'll go into later. There's actually more cords over in the sender monitor position. Um, I have a set of keys here. And in this area right here, I have several numerical keys as well, which I'll go over. Um, up in, up here, I don't know if you can see the light on there. That's a museum specific thing. Um, we have six senders in the museum, and this is just wired up to show us what sender is currently in use. So the red lamp corresponding to the B sender is lit up. So. I have uh, the B senders in use right now. That's actually because I picked up this line, but then for whatever reason it never hung up. So I'm gonna go hang that up real quick. <gasps> I know why it wasn't working, because the sender frame is powered off. Duh! Okay. Right, I shut off the motors because I was like, oh, I'll be quiet, and the motors are off, so of course it's not going to work. Uh, we'll cut that out, I guess. Boop. So a little bit more about these trunk positions. The, the jacks here represent the actual outgoing trunks that are on the district frame that's behind the camera. So any of these trunks are trunks that subscribers would actually be dialing through. They're just also multiple here on the desk so I can access them directly. So for example, I have on this back plane here, I have trunks to uh, our local office. Uh, these are intra-office trunks that come right back here. I have trunks to the number five crossbar. I have trunks to the number one crossbar. I also have trunks to the time lady here and a couple other things throughout the office. So we're only using some of these jacks because we only have some equipment in the museum, not as much as they had when it was actually in use. So uh, I'll give you a little demonstration of how this works. I'm going to pull the camera up a little closer so you can see. 
Okay, so here you can see a close-up of the keys, more or less the voltmeter and the trunk positions. The first thing I'll do is uh, show you how to use the test cord. So for, for trunk tests, we're going to use the second cord. It's helpfully labeled trunk test cord. And I'll just pull it out and I will plug it into an available trunk. Uh, let's just plug it into the number five crossbar. Okay, so nothing happens yet, but I will turn on the voltmeter. And you can see the needle deflects to about 100 volts. What this is doing is it's putting 100 volts of test battery on the trunk and it's showing you that there is a circuit there. Um, now, besides that, I can actually flip these two keys and check for what's called foreign EMF. That's just a fancy way of saying check the actual voltage that's coming back from the distant office to me. I'd expect it to be around 48 to 50 volts. And I look at the voltmeter and I see that's exactly what I've got. Um, I can also use the ammeter, which needs to be reversed. So that's showing me the current draw, which is basically nothing. Um, I can also, on certain trunks, I can talk over the trunk, which lights the talk lamp, telling me it's got talk battery on it. Um, Right now I'm connected to the number five crossbar, so there's really nothing to talk to. It's just the machine. Um, this upper plug is actually to make trunks busy. So you would never plug the, uh, the plug into this jack. But what you could do is if you were taking the trunk out of service for some reason, you can take one of these which is a make busy plug and you can put it in there and now this trunk actually is out of service I won't be able to use it and any subscriber that calls the trunk uh, it will just go right past it to one of the next available trunks so that's how you actually take a trunk out of service if you suspect there's a problem or you're working on it so I'll remove the make busy plug for now and I'll plug my test cord back in. And I'll put on my handy dandy switch person's headset. Now, what I can do is actually place a call over this trunk to the distant office and either call it a test line or a subscriber line or whatever line I feel like calling. So what I will do here is flip these keys. This is basically the make a call position. Um, this one tells it to uh, that you're going to make a direct mechanical call or a reverted pulse call. And this one turns on the headset circuit so I can hear. So I've got myself plugged into the trunk. I actually don't need this key, but these two are in the up position. And on this uh, key set here, I will dial a number that I know will work in the number five crossbar. Just to show you what I'm doing on the key set. Um, you really, it really only ever needs the last four digits because you're already plugged into the outgoing trunk you want to talk on. So I'll just give it the last four of a payphone over behind me. And I also have to give it a compensating resistance value, which is a sort of a line build out for the ideal circuit resistance. So I'll give it that value there. That's 1200 ohms. And in order to place the call, I'll hit the start button. As I hit the start button, you should see this lamp light up and flash. That means that the desk is placing the call. And you might hear the number five crossbar in the background connecting me. And I don't know if the camera's picking it up, but the payphone behind me is ringing. 
disconnect, I can just hit the disconnect key or remove the cord from the jack and either one will disconnect me. So that's a call to the number five crossbar using its jacks. I can also call locally into back into this office over an intra-office trunk. Way to do that is to plug into the jack corresponding to this office here. And on the key set, I'll dial a number that I know works. This happens to be the number of a busy line that should flash uh, a lamp here. Um, so 5118. And I'm going to keep my compensating resistance value where it is because I basically want the maximum since this trunk is so short. It's only, you know, 20 feet long. So I need to add a lot of resistance for that ideal circuit. So I'm going to hit start and you will see the light flash and you'll hear the machine connect me. And when I'm satisfied with the test, I can hit the disconnect key and it will tear down the connection. the desk we have the sender monitor position. The purpose of this position is actually to watch the office alarms which are up here, watch the permanent signal holding trunks, and then also watch the senders to see if any of them get stuck. Now a stuck sender occurs when a subscriber does a thing that the sender doesn't know how to handle. Either because the subscriber really messed up, really bad, or there's some kind of hardware malfunction in the sender that it just gets stuck into a position that it can't handle. What happens with a stuck sender is you'll get a light, you get a lamp here and an alarm. The stuck sender operator can then take the cord, plug into the sender, and then talk on it, and if there's a subscriber there, they'll give the subscriber instructions as to get off the line or try dialing again or call your operator. If there's no subscriber there, they can remove their cord and then by the use of these keys, which are actually pull keys, you pull them out and you can do what's called priming the sender. Priming the sender is essentially just resetting it back to its normal state. In addition, if you suspect that a sender is no good or needs service, you can take one of the uh, Make Busy plugs and stick it in the corresponding plug for that sender. And that will keep the sender out of service. At the top of these two positions, we have our fuse alarms and uh, other office alarms and our permanent signal lamps. I'll start with the fuse alarms. When a fuse blows or a motor stops or a frame goes busy for some reason, there's a corresponding lamp and buzzer that will indicate here to tell you that something's gone wrong. Now what I'll do real quick is simulate a blown fuse condition just so you can see it here. So the lamp and buzzer will go off and the switchman or switch person will go and find whatever the issue is and resolve it. 
Um, besides the fuse alarms, there's also permanent signal alarms. Permanent signal is the condition that happens when the subscriber leaves their phone off the hook. Um, as long as you're off the hook and waiting to dial, you're, you're holding a sender hostage, essentially. So the senders have a built-in timeout that after anywhere between 30 and 90 seconds, they'll give up and they'll send the subscriber to a permanent signal holding trunk, which will either howl at the subscriber or give you that nasty, uh, your phone's off the hook tone. And when a subscriber goes to permanent signal, a lamp will light here. So I'll send a phone to permanent signal real quick just to show you what it looks like. Now because I've left my phone off the hook and I've gone to permanent signal, you can see that the lamp is flashing here to indicate to the, to the desk operator that there's a subscriber who's left their line off the hook. So the desk person will take their permanent signal cord, plug it into this jack, and then flip a key to address that line. Either there's somebody on it, and then you can tell them to hang up their phone, or, their, or nobody answers. In addition to addressing the line, you can actually place what's called a graduated howler on the line by operating a key on this side. And that graduated howler will be sort of a, a whining, crying tone that gets louder and louder every 10 seconds until it reaches a maximum volume and then it starts again. The hope there is that it, the subscriber will eventually realize their phone's off hook, thereby freeing the permanent signal. If the permanent signal condition persists for an unreasonably long time, it could indicate that there's been a, a short somewhere out in the outside world. And for that, the desk operator would fill out a trouble card and send it out to an outside plant technician to investigate. At the very far right of the desk, we have uh, this smaller cabinet, which is line load control and sender load indicator. The sender load indicators are really just two ammeters, one for sender group one and one for sender group two. As each sender is being used, they'll close a relay, and as more and more senders are in use, more and more of those relays will close, and uh, this gauge will go up. So we don't use these gauges because we can't in their current configuration. These are set up for about maybe 70 to 100 senders, and we only have six, one or two of which are in use at any given time. So these are meant to indicate if 30, 40, or 50 senders are in use. So if we hook these up, you wouldn't see them move anyway. I could modify the circuit slightly uh, to make them go up, but that would be kind of cool. I think that's a cool project. Down here is the line load control. Um, Customer lines are divided into, I'm pretty sure, three classes of service based on criticality. And if there were, say, a natural disaster where the office got overloaded with people trying to originate phone calls, you could operate the keys on this line load control box to actually take lower priority lines out of service, to force them out of service, to give the higher priority lines precedence um, in the system, and that's just what line load control does. Anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, stay tuned, who knows what wacky, crazy videos I'll come up with next.